Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we got a very, very special guest. We got the best dressed person at Tennis Channel. We got the voice that you hear recorded introducing TC Live. We got the man, the myth, Steve Weissman on the show. Also working for the NFL Network. So he's multifaceted and multi-talented. So welcome to the show. You finally made it on here. I, I, I made it. This, this is a big day to come out. We talked about this during Indian Wells. Um, I, we manifested this. I was like, I, I want to be on the show. So, and, and I appreciate the compliment about best dress because your wardrobe is second to none. So for that to come from you, uh, me, means a great deal. So I appreciate that. And uh, I, I'm grateful to be on the show. Thanks for having me. But mine is hard because I got, I'm taller. I got like 37 inch arms. I got this long neck I try to hide. You know, yours is more compact. It's easier for you to like put it together. So you can pull stuff off that I can't pull off. Everything is still fitted to me. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I truly believe that's what you have to do when it comes to, to clothes and dressing. Like you just have to go to a tailor and make it because nothing comes off the rack and fits any human really, right? So go to a tailor. Get it fitted to your body, and I think it'll look good. <laughs> so speaking of fitted, right, you, you, you work on two networks. You work NFL Network. You didn't play college tennis. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to kind of make it in this bubble, right, because tennis is kind of like this small, incestuous, everybody was somebody's cousin, best friend, even the agents, right, somebody's cousin's best friend's son or tennis lineage. How did you make it in this small circle given how tight it is well I have played my whole life I, I, I played number one singles in high school my junior and senior year so I, I was a, a decent player uh, I still play a ton but I would say when I when I got to ESPN uh, they that was one thing that I wanted to do other than you know sports center outside the lines all the stuff that I did studio wise I wanted to be a part of the tennis coverage and so uh, a gentleman by the name of Don Cole Antonio gave me that break to host and call matches for uh, ESPN3, basically. So I did the Australian Open on the DirecTV Mosaic, the US Open for that, Wimbledon for that. So I did about five years of the, you know, DirecTV ESPN3 stuff and met folks like Chanda Rubin and Mark Woodford and the Jensen brothers and Taylor Dent um, and, and just a whole bunch of folks in the tennis world. And so when I left ESPN, I sent an email to um, Bob Wiley at, at, at Tennis Channel and, and I was going to Indian Wells. It was March, 2015, because Mark Woodford had become a dear friend. And he was like, why don't you come out? He lives you know, out there in the desert, stay with us and I'll get you a gig with BBC Radio and you can just you know, chill out, have a, have a little vacation. And so I ended up not meeting with Bob, but he was like, how about you do a, a, a two day paid tryout? So you call matches for two days on, on our air. And I was like, absolutely. So my first match was Marty Fish's comeback uh, when he played Ryan Harrison after all that time off uh, with the mental health. And so I had gotten to know Marty through friends at ESPN and he had become a buddy of mine. And so it was kind of this, you know, perfect match for me to come back and call knowing him so well. And um, I did this, I, I love to write and that's a big part of, you know, what I do in broadcast. And so I wrote out this intro for the match and I'll never forget Mary Carrillo, who I'd never met at the time, came over and, and gave me a kiss on my, my head. And I was like, wow, like, all right, I'm in, you know, like she, <laughs> she, she appreciated, you know, the care that I put into it. And, uh, you know, I called that match with Jim and Lindsay and then I called a Sloan, Sloan match the next day uh with Lindsay and you know after I did that Bob was like you killed it we're gonna bring you back and so things I, I started to fly out to LA and call some more matches um and then I had an audition at NFL Network that April and then they hired me to host their morning show so I was living out of a hotel in Marina Del Rey for five months from July to October of 2015 while also flying to DC to do the city open for tennis channel and flying to New York to do the U S open actually for ESPN still at the time. And then I made the, the decision to move myself to LA because there was nothing for me in Connecticut and all of my 
you know, potential opportunities and things that I was doing was out here, NFL Network and Tennis Channel. And so I made that move December 10th, 2015. Didn't have any contracts or anything set in stone. And the uh, very next day, I was back at NFL Network. They signed me to a deal. And, and you know, that January, uh, Tennis Channel signed me to my first deal. And so, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to obviously Mark Woodford and, and, and a lot of folks in the tennis community, because I think, you know, when I first stepped into that booth with Jim and Lindsay, knowing that I was staying at Woody's house kind of broke down a barrier, right? So, oh, he's staying at a Hall of Famer's house, like he must be okay. And so from then on, you know, it's, it's, I truly believe that tennis is a family. And, um, and from, you know, Lindsay, to Jim, to Paul, to Chanda, to Tracy, to literally everybody that I, I work with at Tennis Channel, um, you know, I go to their homes, stay with them on vacation. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's such a thrill for me. And, and I feel truly blessed to, to be a part of this community, because as you say, it is this, this little, you know, tennis bubble world. Um, and, and I feel like everybody kind of helps each other. And it's been, uh, it's been an amazing journey. And, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah, you got to give a shout out to Bob because Bob is famous for that, right? To see talent and to throw you out there. I remember my first time I landed, he said, all right, be at the station at 6 a.m. All right. And I'm like thinking there's going to be two or three hours of training. He said, all right, you and Leaf are together. I'm like, well, shit, where's, where's my trainer? Where's my, you know, it was like trial by fire kind of thing, right? So Bob is good at seeing people who can plug in and giving them an opportunity, you know, so I'm forever grateful to Bob for yeah, that. Absolutely. So, you know, and it was good, right? So now that you're in it now, um, and you're, you know, one of the main guys at the French Open, one of the actually main faces of TC Live, um, who's been your toughest interview in tennis? Because I find tennis players, you know, we don't get a lot of practice behind the microphone because only one person wins, right? One man one woman wins, you know, the finalist gets a little bit of time at the, at the podium, but in a week you're forgotten, right? No one, no one remembers second place. No one remembers first place. And so I feel like a lot of our tennis players, even five, six years into their career are underdeveloped behind the microphone in front of the camera, because you could have, you could be top 10 in the world and never win a tournament. So given that, who's been your toughest interview to be honest, like none of them have been super, I wouldn't say tough. Um, I do so much research before my interviews and, you know, from scouring their social media to Googling every sort of thing about them. Because when I'm interviewing a player, I want to learn about them. I want their personality to shine. I want to know more about them even off the court than on the court. Um, and so the, the tennis to me is like, you know, there's definitely a couple questions about tennis but I'm looking to engage them in, a, in, a, in another way. So if you give me 30 seconds pre-interview to talk to somebody, it, the toughest part would honestly be when somebody comes straight on set that I don't know that well, because at this point I know a lot of the players pretty well. But if there's somebody I've never interviewed before and I don't get that 30 seconds just to break them down, make them laugh, make them smile, whatever, then it's tough because then there's not that, that, that trust factor, right? But all I need is 30 seconds before on air to you know throw out something that I know about them that maybe they didn't think I knew. And then it's like, okay, Steve's cool, let's go. Um, so I've had, I've had great experiences. Honestly, doing the interviews is one of my favorite parts of the job because I take that information to every other aspect of what I do, whether it's calling a match and knowing certain tidbits that I wouldn't have known otherwise or hosting TC live and being able to know, you know, different facts. Um, and sometimes it's in that 30 seconds to a minute that something will come out that I didn't know. And that becomes the, the best part of the interview. So, you know, it, it's really just engaging with the player and, and getting to, to be on a human level. Right. So, you know, the best interviews, um, when I get to talk to, to Novak and Roger, I mean, they're two of the smartest people on the planet. I mean, they're just like, they're one of ones, right? And so you don't get to that level of success athletically or in terms of endorsements, financially, all that stuff without being just a genius at what you do. 
And so I'm trying, like, I, I take those moments very seriously. And, I, and I'm, I find myself so grateful to be able to spend nine to 10 minutes with that type of a, of a, of a person and kind of learn their philosophy and how they, you know, have gotten to where they are and that sort of thing. Coco Goff is another player that really stands out in terms of just how smart she is. Um, I, I find her picking up things quicker than I do. Like she is so witty and like fast and I'm like, I got to keep up with her sort of thing. Um, so I love talking to her and we always talk about the Marvel universe and um, <laughs> Avengers and, you know, all, all this kind of like off court stuff that yeah. she loves and, and I love and, and we kind of connect on that level that may not have anything to do with tennis. When I talk to Naomi Osaka, she takes you on the journey. And I love that journey, right? So it's like, I could come prepared with everything, but, but she has this mind where it's like, I'm gonna talk about what I wanna talk about and it may be tennis, it may not be tennis and you're gonna have to react to me. So that kind of like keeps me on my toes and I really appreciate that. And she's just so open and honest and uh, I, I learned from her as well. And so that's something that I, that I don't take for granted is being able to learn. I find these interviews is where if I'm learning, the audience is learning uh, because I, I truly believe I'm an expert in the sport and know a lot of stuff. So if, so if I've learned something new, then the audience has learned something new. And that it is a moment that I'm trying to get. So you, so you spoke about like Naomi Osaka, Coco, um, and you mentioned the word trust, right? And I think over the past couple of years, we've seen people opt out of press, media, whatever. And I was always thinking that perhaps there is something we can do to protect them or work together, right? Because if you look at like the face of basketball, it used to be Michael Jordan, right? And it was like, hey, we're all going to interview Mike, but he's the face of the NBA. So don't ask no silly shit, right? You know what I mean? It was kind of like, don't cross the boundaries. What do you think we can do? And it's not just, you know, Osaka. I mean, I've, I've Coco Vandaway. I mean, you know, I've, like there's a lot of people that I can name that are like, yeah, I'll take the fine. I'm not going to media. You know what I mean? Like, what can we? <laughs> I love talking to Coco Vandaway. She's great. I know, right? <laughs> but you know, I've been around like, yeah, I'm not going. They can take the 1200 bucks, right? So like, what can we do to sort of bridge that? Because I, I had the suggestion, and I guess I'm not a true journalist, right? I'm sort of getting my feet wet and commentating. Why not give them the questions the night before to make them feel comfortable? Why not say, hey, who on this list of journalists do you not want in the room? <laughs> right <laughs> you okay. know what i mean so so that you can come right or what can we you know so what, what do we do to sort of like find the balance where we help them perform better in the interviews help them feel more comfortable doing it help them grow the brand their individual brands so they can then grow the sport because the sport is leveraged off their brands you know what i mean yeah i mean honestly it's it's if, and it's the same thing with television. What's the hardest thing about TV is to be yourself, Kamal, because if you're you, by that nature, we, we all have our own fingerprints, whatever, you're going to be unique, you're going to stand out. And what a lot of folks that get into TV do is like, they try to impersonate, you know, what X, Y, or Z broadcaster that they look up to may be. And they're not going to stand out, they're going to look like somebody pretending to be somebody else. So it's the same thing for an athlete who's doing an interview, if they've been, you know, media coach, yada, yada, and they have these certain points and it's very robotic, they are not going to come across the same as somebody who is naturally themselves. And most of these players, I mean, I don't know a lot of folks that aren't cool off court. So it's that same personality that I want to bring out on court. And that's the trust. So if you give somebody questions, this is what I'm going to ask you tomorrow, which by the way, may change, right? Like the, the questions may not hold up the next day. I think you're going to get answers that are, you maybe you wrote out or is it's not going to come across well. Um, in terms of who do you want to talk to? Who do you not want to talk to? I think they kind of have that ability, not in press, obviously, but like in terms of coming to our desk, they can yeah. always turn down coming to our desk, but I think they enjoy coming, you know, to the desk. I've found. Um, so because it is that trust factor and it's like, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. I'm also not going to not address something that needs to be addressed. Um, but it's just like developing those relationships. I think that goes the furthest. You have to 
know somebody, somebody like Seb Corda, who I don't know, I met probably in like 2017 when he was still playing juniors at Roland Garros and then have gotten to know more and more and more and more and then, you know, follow each other on social media. And, you know, like a lot of these players who I, I truly support and believe in, um, and I don't I could say bias, not bias, whatever, but like, that's the tennis world. Um, you know, somebody like Sloan, who I got to spend so much time with uh, in Charleston and is an absolute rock star. And whenever she wants to do TV, is going to be a superstar and amazing. And, you know, I tend to then support her after that. You know, same thing with Taylor Townsend. I'm texting her after, you know, she won in Charleston, that 100K, every match. Like, I, I get invested in, in people that you know and care about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, same thing with Jeannie Bouchard, who worked with us at Indian Wells, or the, the Bryan brothers, who are no longer playing, but like you get invested with the athletes that you know more. And it's the same thing if Amanda Anasimova has come to the desk five straight times because she's on her way to the quarterfinals or semifinals. It's just going to get more and more fun because we know each other, you know, better and better. And that relationship is growing. So um, that that's just relationships in life, right? Like the more you know somebody, the more trust the more open you're going to be and the more natural the conversation is going to be and that's the best interview in my opinion is when it is a natural conversation so you mentioned Roland Garros and I think right now we are seeing I don't want to say a changing of the guard but we are witnessing some things that are rare right what Iga is doing is rare um what Alcarez is doing is rare right yep what do you make of that? Because I'm always like for Iga in particular, I'm like, okay, she's on a roll. When I look at everyone that made it to number one in the world, not only were they good, but they also had momentum. But when I look at people who were close and only got to two or three or four, either they started taking tournaments off to rest right? Um, They didn't capitalize on the momentum. Understanding that you got to have a great year and you got to also have momentum. Even if you're tired, you only get to two or three once, right? And if you're that close to one, you just got to go and be tired after, right? Because being number one, even if it's for two weeks, three weeks, that's his story. So I'm looking at the fact that she's continuing to play. Right. And I'm like, that's the right way to do it. Right. When you get hot, keep going. You know what I mean? So what do you what are you as a journalist, you're sitting back watching this? What are you thinking right now? Wow. I mean, for one, uh, not having Ash Farty has, has changed the landscape. Right. Because she ended her career on a winning streak and winning the Australian Open and was by far the number one player in the world. So I don't know if we're currently where we're at if Ash is still playing. So that's a factor. Two, Iga has taken this number one ranking and run with it. And I think, you know, I I saw her win Roland Garros a couple of years ago as a teenager and, you know, she thrashed folks. And I think a lot of it was her game. And then some of it was her mental game. Um, And a lot of it, I mean, you can speak more to this, but I mean, tennis is, you know, 90% mental 70 percent, whatever it is it's more mental than it is physical they can all hit balls they can all hit forehands backhand serves whatever who's who's gonna in in those you know five all deuce moments win that point and so Iga has embraced that from the start with you know um a psychologist that travels with her and I think that has been invaluable for her growth as a tennis player and so now I mean to see her barely lose games in finals and I think she averages less than two or three games lost in the last eight finals. That's crazy to be able to bring your best tennis in those biggest moments when it matters most. And that's what the greats do. So now, you know, she's won 28 matches in a row. She enters Roland Garros is, you know, by far the the biggest favorite, a tournament she's already won. I do have a question for you though, because you say, you know, playing, playing, playing. What did you make? And obviously it worked, she won Rome, but what what did you make of her not playing Madrid after she had won, you know, a few tournaments in a row? So I thought that was smart because if you play Madrid and you win it, you take off Rome, 
you're definitely not going to go play a 250 in Strasbourg or anywhere else. So now you got two weeks off before a slam, and that's probably too much time. So you can't play both Madrid and Rome if you're eager. Uh, if you're going to skip one, you skip the you skip the first one, right? So that you can have more matches closer to the slam, right? So that was that was that was tricky, right? And I don't really think it matters, honestly. Let me tell you why. When you think about a young player or a tennis player's biggest injury, biggest risk to injury, it is time on court. Hmm. And you look at somebody like Big Fo, right? My guy, but he blow a 4-1 lead in a minute, right? And so when you do that, you end up being on the court longer than you should. When you look at Iga, because she'll be up 3-1, the server will have a game point, and she's still trying to get that point. You know, where some people are like, all right, whatever, you can hold, right? I'm, I'm still up a break, whatever, you can hold, right? She doesn't do that. Yeah. And so when you look at, we talk about her scores, she's really, she could have played both. Not saying she should have, she did the right thing clearly, but she could have played both because how efficient she is. She just says, you know what? I'm going to go 100% from start to finish and I'm going to win two and one. I'm not going to go 50%, let you hold and I hold, let you hold and I hold. And at four all, I'll try to break. She doesn't do that. So she's not on the court as long. So you look at, I would estimate if you look at her time on court, it's probably only two thirds of what Jabour's was. Right. Or you look at Miami, only two thirds of what the other person. So that's the thing. She's not, the tennis players got to start to monitor. Like when you talk about load management, load management ain't taking a week off. Load management is don't blow the four one lead. So how many, how many of the top 10 or top 20 do what Iga does? All of them. Oh, you mean in terms of play every point? Yes. Her? One. One. I mean, you, I mean, you see, you see people all the time. You get down 45 on a return game and you let them hold. Right. That's okay. But it does keep you on the court a game longer. Yeah, you know no, I mean? absolutely. Absolutely. So you, so you can fight for these next two. Then maybe they give you one on a double fault or something like that. Right. Or you can let them have this game and have to play a whole nother game. Right. Or, you know, or, or the score, the pressure, the nerves kick in because the score, maybe that break disappears later in the set. You know what I mean? So I think that very few people are doing that. Right. And I think that is her edge. And that's why it looks like her matches go fast. And it looks like she doesn't hit the ball big. Right. But it looks like she's playing fast because she's playing every point. Right. And she's on and off so quick. And I think that if there's one lesson that I think both tours can take from her is to play every point. It's, right? it's that Rafa mentality. Right. I mean, like yeah. she always talks about looking up to Rafa. And that's her hero, you know, and that's how she wants to be. That's Rafa. So I do see that in Carlos Alcaraz, that same sort of mentality of not taking points off. But it, that, it's so rare, Kamau, on either tour to have that mentality. I mean, it, and, that, and, and Rafa's just built that way. I mean, he didn't even retire in his match that, you know, Jim Curry was saying he should retire in his match on the commentary because he is hurt and he needs to get well for Roland Garros but he's just not wired that way. Mm -hmm. Like he, he's not going to retire. He's going to play every point. He's going to play every point 100% because that's just who he is. And, and that's why he has 21 majors. And that's why, you know, he's arguably the greatest of all time. And that's why Iga is doing what she's doing because it's that same mentality that, that you're right. You know, there, it, there's like one here and one there, maybe two. <laughs> right. And you look at Zvera, right? Zvera is like, I mean, when you look at like his performance early in slams, particularly at the French, I remember two years ago at the French, he was down two sets to nothing in like his first three matches and one in five, right? Yeah. And those are the types of things where I'm looking like, eh, you're not going to escape death every time. Yeah. Number one. Number two, you're now on the court for an extra two hours. Number three, we're playing after you. Get your ass off the court. Right? <laughs> like, Get, get off the court before the rain comes, dude, because we're on the court after you, right? So I, you, you think about all those things when I look at, like, 
you know, these players and you think about who's going to like sort of leave their mark and maximize their opportunity and the momentum is that, and, you know, giving somebody a 40, 15 game does kill your momentum. Like an easy game for me is a hold or a break. It doesn't matter. It does give me confidence. And I think that Iga right now and Alcaraz are not letting you breathe. They're like, bro, you up four zero down 30 love, relax. Let me just hold. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, if you're playing them, you're thinking that, and they just keep on coming. It's like, okay, come on now, right? Yeah, and that, that's what sets them apart. And that, and that's, I, I love seeing that because that's the mentality that I think we should all approach life with, right? I mean, every moment to, to give it your all, and, and whether it's every TC Live or, you know, every Tennis.com podcast or, you know, a, a, everything you do should be approached that way. Um, and there should also be time for rest and recovery and, and all those things to, to balance your life. But that it's inspiring, honestly, to watch Iga do what she's doing and, 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 and Carlitos. He doesn't like to be called Carlos. Carlitos or Charlie? Or as Andy Roddick calls him, Chucky. Chucky, Chucky. Alcaraz. Um, he is like, but it, he is like it, little Chucky, little night murderer. Right? He's not, he's not that big. Like, you see him head to head with Rafa. Rafa's much bigger than he is. But to be able to dominate the way he's dominating, serve as fast as he does, move the way he does, do everything the way he does. I'm curious because... We've always on, on TC Lab been like, tell us, is there a hole in his game? Please, you know, tweet us, let us know. Have you found anything in Carlos Alcaraz's game that is a hole, that, it, that is a weakness? So I would say, number one, he has a perfect tennis body. He doesn't have any weird proportions. You see some people with like long, long legs, short torso or super long arms. When you look at his body, he was so easy to teach because his proportions are so perfect. And when your proportions are perfect, you have great balance, mm. right? Great balance on a tennis yeah. court is everything. You actually don't have to be fast. I mean, tennis is like, there's a lot of slow people on tour, right? Sure. Making money, right? But they all have great balance. And they all can change direction and they all can retreat because the tennis court is not that big, right? Um, so I think from a body type standpoint, if you look at like him and Novak, almost perfect proportions. So that's number one. Number two, I think that the only weakness, well, potential weakness would be fifth set. We haven't seen right. the way he goes, right? Like Novak and Rafa, they can go all the way to the end of the fifth set. And you see a lot of people outplay both of them in the first two sets. Like you think about the year, like uh, was it last year, the Olympic year, where Novak won everything. The only matches he lost were two out of three yeah. because those players can outplay him in two out of three, but you can't outplay him in three out of five. And mm -hmm. so Alcaraz hasn't proven yet that he can play with that intensity, that level of concentration mm -hmm. for five sets. And so, right. so, so let me ask you this question. He's right now the best player on tour. Iga's right now the best female player on tour. Are those your two picks for the French? So I would say that Novak is still the best player on tour. I would. I, I, I know Carlos beat him in a three-setter, you know, tie break in the third. Does that make him better than Novak? In my opinion, no, uh, be, because of the history and knowing three out of five is a different ball game. And one of them has 20 majors and is the defending champion there. And the other one has zero majors and has never paid, made it past the third round there. So no. <laughs> It's, those are the facts that it doesn't, you know, he's ranked six in the world and in the race, he's, you know, up there, but even more so, but I still say Novak and what he was able to prove winning Rome makes him the number one favorite heading into Roland Garros. We had the DraftKings odds before the final and Alcaraz was actually the favorite over Novak and Rafa, which I think is wild. I believe they've changed since Djokovic won Rome. And But to be above Rafa is also crazy to me. I know people talk about the foot. Um, he's got two weeks to get it right. And a champion like that, I'm never going to bet against. So he's won 13 times there. And for me to now be like, yeah, there's two other guys that have a combined two titles there that have a better chance. That's really hard for me to do. Um, I say pick against Rafa at your own peril because that, that's his, you know, Coliseum. Uh, Philippe Chatrier. I mean, that, that's his place. Like 
So um, I think he's going to be fine. And, and I think his dominance there, his dominance, best three out of five on clay, three losses ever. Like he's still got to be your favorite. He's still got to be your favorite. And then, and then you put Novak and then you put Carlitos to me because it wouldn't surprise he's 19 years old. He's doing everything that, you know, Rafa did back in 2005, which is amazing. And I love it. And I love it for our sport. And I think he's going to win majors. And I think he'll probably win a major as a teenager. Is this the one he's going to win? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. And, I, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if he didn't get to the quarterfinals. It really wouldn't. It, w- it wouldn't shock me if he won. Would I be like, oh, my God, he won? No. Like, he's amazing. You, you just said he's the best player on the planet right now. But would it shock me if he lost before the quarterfinals? No. He's a teenager that's never gotten past the third round. So – I would say that's accurate. He probably won't even make it past the fourth round. Um, I don't think Rafa wins. I think it's too physical. And, you know, this this sport, like if with, an, with a physical ailment, to win seven matches on a physical court like that is hard. I think... The person that is playing, my pick for the, to win the French Open would be Zverev. Hmm. Finals of Madrid, semis of Rome to lose to Tissi Pass. I pick, I think that those are two solid results. He'd be some quality opponents, right? He lost to Tissi Pass. He lost to Alcaraz. Both, you know, good, good matches, right? So I think those two results make him my favorite to win the French call me crazy. Now it's not crazy. I mean, listen, I've picked yeah. him to win a major every year and I've been wrong every year. So, <laughs> um, why not? Why not him? Right. I mean, he's a, he's a great player that said he just hasn't proven it. And I think, and I think that one of the things that startles young players is the attention. And I think, you know, there's been less chatter about his second serve and about the yips Alcaraz is sort of taking all the air out the room. And I think Zverev is in like a weird space where he's having good results, not under the radar, but kind of going at his own pace. Nobody's like grabbing him and shaking him and like, oh, you know, I think he's he's in a good space. And when I see people win slams, it's all about like the tone and the temperament. And I feel like Alcarez has got too much hype now to make it past the fourth round, right? Because everybody know you're coming, so I'm ready for you, right? Um, and I think he's had more time on TV, so more time for people to scout and watch. Uh, and I think Zverev is in like a nice sweet spot where he's playing well enough, but still like fourth or fifth in terms of maybe even sixth or seventh. You still got Tissipaz, Alcaraz, Djokovic, Novak. You still got some people that's like, eh, you know, and I think that's, you kind of got to have a quiet environment to make it through two weeks. So that don't be surprised. If, uh, no, I, it wouldn't shock me. I just, I think, I think Stefanos is a better player at Roland Garros than Zverev is. So if they played there, I think, I think Sitsipas wins that match. Um, and I mean, I could see a guy like Casper Ruud beating Zverev there. Um, it, the draw will, will determine a lot. Mm. I think it'd be really hard for Zverev to beat Djokovic. Three to five there. But listen, like he's got the game. It, the, the second serve has been and continues to be a, a bit of an issue. So fifth set, what happens, right? Do we get what we got at the U.S. Open against Dominic Team? And by the way, the fact that none of us on the planet are talking about Dominic Team, and I know he lost another first round match. He hasn't won a match all year. Yeah. I, it, it breaks my heart. Like this guy was, you know, top three in the world, two-time finalist there, major champion. No and chance. Now, now he can't win a match. And I'm like, Not what's going year. on? The physicality of the game, even from two years ago, is so different. And, and if you're injured, that's what I'm saying with Rafa, if you are not 100%, it's going to be hard on the most physical court yeah. in this thing. So let me ask you this. Yeah. Women, are you picking Iga? Are you going with the easy? you going with the layup? I mean, that's an easy pick and she's so good and it's not, and, and I think she's a great person. She's a great player. That would 
get her to 35 wins in a row, uh, which would, I believe, tie Venus for the longest winning streak since 2000. But history has shown, like, who would have picked Barbora Krejcikova last year? Zero humans, right? Zero. Like, maybe her family. Maybe. Uh, who would have picked Iga Spiontek two years ago? Zero humans. Well, let me give you one. The year before that, I was coaching Monica Puy. Yeah. Third round in the French. Monica was up 6 0, 3 0. On Iga. Okay. To play Halep in the next round. And in the next round, this girl wins the French Open. I'm like, what a difference 12 months makes. Right. I mean, but like, you wouldn't have picked her to win that 2020 French Open, right? Hell no. It wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been in your radar. Would have been yeah, not no part chance. of your radar. So, knowing that the last six players to win Roland Garros on the women's side have been first time major champions, not just first time Roland Garros champions, first time major champions, makes me think that it's going to be. You know, there's a lot of options there. You've got Bedosa, you've got Sakari, you've got, in my opinion, Jesse Pagula is, is my dark horse. She's five in the race. I think that surface does well for her. I think she's killing it this year. Not enough people are talking about her. Um, Coco Golf, why not, right? Why not? Like, I, so... Um, I think there's a lot of po- Amanda Anasimova has already made the semifinals there. Is actually playing really well right now. Okay. And that's a great, great yeah. surface for her. Why not? She, she, you know, so there are so many options for first time major winners that I have to take the field over Ega. I can't pick one because like it's probably somebody I didn't even just name. But, <laughs> uh, but those, those are people I'm thinking about right now that have a good shot to win because there's a lot of pressure and I know Iga handles pressure better than anyone, but this is a major, you're coming in all eyes on you. You're, you're not only, are you the favorite, you're the world number one, you've won 28 matches. There's so much going on. If anybody can handle that, it's Iga Spiante. So it would not surprise me if she won that said, I think the field has a better chance. I abstain from picking women's tennis. (laughs) <laughs> so, I'm going to let you have that one. <laughs> so now, Svitolina and Monfils. Svitolina, just now she's pregnant. Probably no surprise to most. Interesting timing, right? Monfils is injured. Um, probably has contemplated retirement several times. Um, do you think that this is it for either or both of them? I hope not. Um, I, uh, Gael's been playing so well of late. You know, I know. It's like he was just getting it. He was like. Right? Crowds are back. He, he's, he's so fun to watch. And such like another one. Great interview. Love talking to Gael. Couldn't be a nicer human. Fun. He'll go wherever you want to go, go with it, you know, sort of thing. Um, so I hope it's not. I don't think it is for him. And for Svitolina, I hope not as well. I think she you know, has been so close and it was one of those, you know, best to ever not win a major sort of thing. Like it's like her, Pliskova, probably a little higher because she's been to finals and been ranked number one in the world. Um, so I would like to see her win one, but. And probably should have won that one. Was it 16 when she played Kerber? That probably was the one she should have won. She let that one get away. Yeah, I mean, she's let a few get away, but no, I don't. I don't think it's the. I don't think it's the end for them. I, I don't. I think Jim's life lives on. They they bring their baby <laughs> on the road, and it's just like it's a fun. I think they have fun with it, especially since they're both on the road. They can, you know, they get plenty of money. They can take have somebody take care of the baby while they're with them. Like, yeah, I think it's going to become maybe that that should be the next couple that Netflix follows, right? So Netflix is doing the series with all the the women's and the men's play. I cannot wait to watch when that comes out next year or whenever they follow the, uh, the Monfils. Hmm. That'd be a good one. <laughs> That'd be a real good one. So let me ask you this. We talked about how you work for NFL network. You work for tennis. You know, we both are ambassadors for the sport. Like any cocktail party, you talk about baseball. I'm going to say, dude, you stand there. 
The dude got to pitch it to you perfect. Otherwise, you don't have to swing because it's a ball. And you, you know, the greatest baseball player ever was Babe Ruth, who was a fat man. Right? So, tennis to me. Who was a fat man? Right? You know, <laughs> tennis to me the belongs to be where we hold and value baseball. Right? Yeah. Um, number one revenue sport for women. Right? Nine out of top ten highest paid female athletes or tennis players. Period. Point blank. It's a fact. Yep. Um, most global. Right? I mean, tennis, soccer. Right? You can count it there. Uh, what can we do to, to sort of grow it? Or what have you seen done either at the NFL Network, from a broadcasting standpoint, advertising standpoint, commentary standpoint, interviewing? where we can sort of continue to just inch forward and get the respect we deserve. (laughs) Show us some respect. Um, And and I think we do get it on an international level. And I think that's an interesting part because it's so global. That's what makes it harder to um, separate here in the States because football NFL in the rest of the world is not what it is here. Right. So soccer here is not what it is in the rest of the world. And the global nature of tennis and having, you know, our, our number one player from Poland on the women's side and our number one player from Serbia on the men's side hurts us here. Um, we need to have Americans be number one on, on both sides. And, and then the game is huge, right? So when it was Pete and Andre, when it's the Williams, when, you know, like, I think that's when it's huge here. Um, we have a lot of great players, by the way, that, that can get there. Uh, That said, I think something the NFL Network does really well is every event is a Super Bowl. So we just covered um, the schedule release, right? And it was a huge deal, like leading up to it. A whole week's of shows about the schedule release. We're not playing until the fall, by the way, come out. And and we don't even know who's going to be the starting quarterback. But the schedule release became, has become, we made it into a massive event. So right now, draws for every tournament, but especially the majors, where do you find them? Where do you see them, right? So they're, maybe they're streamed, maybe they're not. I remember I, I was watching the Australian Open draw earlier this year. It was a disaster. Like people didn't know, I didn't know who was talking, what they were talking about. They couldn't pronounce names right. Like this is literally the Australian Open draw said the names wrong. And I'm like, what, what are we doing? So that's something that needs to be a moment, right? Like that, that all leading up to it, matchups we could have. And then on that day, breaking it down and, and as it, as it's released, having, you know, players come in, what you, and I, some tennis players don't like to look at the draw, whatever, make the sport better, start looking at the draw. Right. You know? Like talk about it. Cause that, that would make it better. We would love to hear that because the, the NFL players are talking about it. The, you know, Giants are talking about playing the Cowboys later in the season or, or whatever it, you know, may be. Um, so I think that type of thing, the combine. Before NFL Network started airing the combine, nobody cared about the combine, right? Now, that's three days of appointment viewing if you're an NFL fan. You are watching folks run in their underwear and jump in their underwear. And, and, and we get huge ratings for that. So I don't know if you can have a, a combine type thing in the off season but if you could that'd be cool and and we you know we, we show players you know doing drills and whatever and, and maybe you get wild cards or something in terms of you know of that so it's every event is the super bowl it's not just the super bowl it's not just the four majors that are hyped up it's the draft it's the combine it's the schedule release it's the start of training camp everything is huge and we do massive shows around all these events. So, um, you know, I think if when you put money into it and promote something, then it becomes bigger. So one of the things that I think, I don't play football. I'm a buck 60 soaking wet. <laughs> but, and I don't even like really watch it. But when I watch it, I learn. You know, when I see Michael Irvin up there drawing and, this thing and this this person switched and this person blocked this person and this person, you know, that kind of thing. I think it makes it a little more layman, right? And I think 
we talk about baseball. Do this is a stick in a ball. Like my kids are playing baseball now, right? Like T-ball. I'm like, this is a stick in the ball, right? And he's running from here to there and putting his foot on the bag, right? I'm sure there's something more complicated that I'm not observing, but this is pretty elementary, right? And sometimes I think our sport is so complex mm-hmm. that it's hard to get into. I mean, because I'll sit at a bar or I'll even sit on an airplane. I'll sit even in the hotel lobby with other coaches and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, that is <laughs> not true, right? That was a dumb shot. That is not going to happen that way, right? Um, and it's like, where do we, do we educate and dumb it down so more people who, I don't play football, but I watch it and when I, I watch it when I feel like it's interesting. So more people who may not necessarily play can learn. Because the four O player still needs to learn, the four five player still needs to learn, right? And so if you got people like you know Paul, Lindsey, Tracy, I mean these are some of the Jim, some of the greatest players ever. Yeah, you know what I mean. How do we reel in the the three point five player, right? That learns something. Like forget about uh, your Stremska, you know, on the court screaming, yelling, whatever, right? Forget about that. <laughs> I can't wait till the match is over so I can hear Paul or Lindsay break down what happened, right? And where this went wrong. Cause it was like, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think we can certainly do that. I, I think they are, they do do that. I mean, like, you know, we have such great, and I mean, Lindsay, Jim, Tracy, yeah. Paul, I mean, you know, Chanda, like everybody is, is so good at what they do. Um, so I think during the matches, they are doing that. And, yeah. you know, we, we do that to an extent on TC live as well. There, there's a time constraint where you can't, you know, do everything you want to do. Um, but, you know, we are able to break that down. I think one of the, the things that, that hurts tennis is that, you know, the NFL has a commissioner, baseball has a commissioner, the NBA has a commissioner, right? Tennis has seven different commissioners um, that generally don't agree with one another and do their own kind of thing. And there's also, in tennis where, you know, you may be on air and also coaching somebody. So you're not allowed to necessarily say things that you would say if you weren't right. Um, And so you may not want to criticize a B or C player because of what's going on. (laughs) Or friendship. Yeah. And friendship. Cause you got to see them in a small family. So I think that's one thing that makes tennis great but can take away from complete and utter transparency because i think having you when you coach sloan or paul when he coaches taylor we're getting insight or or Lindsay when she coaches madison whatever we're getting insight that nobody else knows that said it's going to be filtered in like we're not going to get everything we're still getting something that nobody else knows and i value that Mm -hmm. um so you know, I, I think we can always do better at everything in life, but I think it, it's a star driven sport. Whereas, you know, football, basketball, yes, star driven, but like you're still rooting for a team. You're not rooting for one player per se. So when Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic, Rafa Nadal, when, when they're in an event, it's big. When Serena and Venus are in an event, man, it's big um now it, it's growing with osaka like she is a global icon so when she goes someplace it's big um i think alcaraz may get that way but if it's an american it's gonna be even bigger yeah so you get coco golf which I, and i love coco so like I, i've you know sung her praises this entire podcast i think she's brilliant i think she's an amazing player and i think she's gonna do it all I don't want to rush any. She's 18 years old. She's not only the youngest player. I was telling you this off air. Not only the youngest player in the top 25. She's the youngest player in the top 160. So like nobody's doing what she's doing. She's a one of one. And it's like, if she wins Roland Garros, wouldn't surprise me. Why not? Right? Why not? She could do it. If she doesn't, fine. I'm not going to like, be like, why, why haven't you won yet? Because you're 18. Like, you've got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. That said, when, when, because I do believe she will, when she gets to number one, that's going to be a game changer in, in this country because of all the, you know, not just tennis stuff that she brings to the table. 
um, that that's gonna that's gonna really be a game changer. I think the one other thing that hurts us is timing. Hmm. Matches are happening sure. in the middle of the night. Most of the calendar is abroad, right? Except for U.S. Open Series, maybe you know India, Wales, Miami, that kind of thing, right? But the the Asian Swing, Russia, and breakfast at Wimbledon, you know, what I mean, it's just the time factor for us. Unless you really die hard, you're yeah, not yeah. getting up. You know what I mean to watch tennis in the middle of the night. Australia, killer. Yeah, right? and you don't know how long that match is going to go, when the nat- next match is going to yeah. start, who's going to play the next day. Yeah, for for programming purposes. It's not ideal. It's not ideal. And and I think our tennis players, the margin between winning and losing is so fragile that we feel interviews can alter a mindset. And as a coach and a commentator, yeah, don't go do press. Because they might ask you something that raises doubt. Or they might wake up a sleeping dog right a hundred percent right you know remember the guy was it muhammad who was talking to nick curios yeah in cincinnati whatever it is and he and and roger said well you shouldn't have been talking to him because the conversation can change a mindset and a question can change a mindset or plant something in a player's mind that is totally counter to everything that we talked about in the car or everything we didn't say in the car, right? And I think that part of it is, if I look at both sides of it, right? It does create less transparency. It creates a more guarded player, um, probably makes it hard for the fan to really get to know that person. But on my side, who like makes money when you win matches, I'm like, screw that, let's win, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, winning winning trumps everything. That said, if you're not mentally strong enough, that one question in press is going to change how you play the rest of the tournament. Like that's something we need to work on, right? Let me give you, let me give you an example. Let's just say you win whatever U.S. Open, okay, and you come back the next year, or let's say Australian Open, U.S. Open and say, hey, this is pre-tournament press. And you say, hey, you know what? No one's repeated US Open title since the year 2000 other than Serena Williams. What do you think your chances are? And my response would be, which I thought they were great until you just said that, right? You know what I mean? So like <laughs> those, those types of things, totally harmless, totally factual, right? But it was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like how that can kind of create a little bit of. I, I would take that as I would take that as motivation. Yeah. I wouldn't take so, it as like they were great until you said that. I would take it as like, wow, <laughs> I'm gonna be like Serena. Yeah. Right. Like so, I think that that's the part too where I think you look at NFL Network, NBA. I think the win the, there's less fragility between the win and the loss, and it's less one person. So you got 12 guys, right? Everybody, you know, I had 30, he had 27, he had 15 rebounds, I had 10 assists, right? There's it's less dependent on me, right? So yeah, you could blame Devin Booker and Chris Paul for the Suns losing about 40 at home, or you could blame the rest of the team too for not showing up, right? Whereas yeah. the one player is kind of like, eh, you know what I mean? So I think that in team sports, NFL Network, that kind of thing, you get, you get more color because it's not all up to me, right? Um, but with tennis, it's kind of like, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you this, Kamal. So during Charleston, Angebur made the final, right? And so she didn't come to the tennis channel desk after her first twin. And so because of that, and I like saw her in the hotel, we're chatting, blah, blah, blah. And like the next day, I think it was her quarterfinal and she turned down coming to the desk. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, we've got a great relationship. We were just talking about Uber Eats last, last night. Um, why, you know, like, why isn't she coming? And they said, because she didn't come after her first match, she wasn't going to come until she won. And so literally after the semifinal, she tells like the handler, tell Steve, I'm coming tomorrow with the trophy. But like, I knew she wasn't coming after her semifinal and then she didn't win. So no trophy. And then it was in Madrid um, when she went after every match to Prakash at the desk and she, she, and during every interview, she'd be like, 
hey, I just wanted to say hi to Steve. I'm sorry, like, I'm not just coming. I don't like come, I want him to know that it's not because of this, it's because if I come every time, I'm coming every time. If I'm not, then I'm not. And it's like a superstitious thing. And I'm like, I, so I get it. I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the tennis superstitions are crazy. The commitment to ritual, the, the, the things that we connect to wins and losses that yeah. may or may not connect. Oh, it's in, within this sport, it's crazy. But we're grateful for the connection to you today. Ah, see, I'm, I'm learning from you. We're grateful for the connection to you today. And uh, I appreciate the time you are, you know, ever since you came to TC, you've like been a rock star. You've made everybody else up their dress game. Prakash thinks he's the best dressed man. <laughs> it's really you. He might be the best looking man and have the best hair, but you're the best dressed. And so um, I appreciate you taking the time with us and look forward to watching you. We'll see if Rafa wins. You and I, we, we disagree. I'm going Zvera. You're going Rafa. Yeah, uh, listen, 14, 14 would be nice. Uh, get to 22. We'll see what happens. We'll see if it's a youngster. I, I'm just excited. I think it's one of the most highly anticipated uh, Roland Garros events that we've had in a really long time because we've got a teenager that's, you know, up and coming right now. We've got a, a young 20-year-old on the women's side who's ranked number one in the world. And then we've got a lot of other folks that are, that are still there um, going for the title. It's Paris. It's beautiful. Can't wait to get there. Uh, appreciate you having me on the show. Um, always appreciate having you on TC Live. We need to see more of you on Tennis Channel. Um, and uh, I hope to get to see you soon. All right, brother. Thanks so much. This has been a Tennis.com podcast with Steve Weissman.